Okay, so far we've been using the setup, we've been keeping the battery off. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to use that battery to turn this plate positive. So when that becomes positive, it's going to start attracting the electrons towards it, speeding the electrons up towards the positive plate. However, the effect on the current is negligible. It barely increases. That's because the current is going to be mainly determined by the number of electrons going across per unit time. And the thing determining the number of electrons that are being released is the light and the intensity of the light. Basically, the number of photons per unit time being released by the light. Because if there's, for example, 100 photons being released, the best case scenario is you're going to get 100 electrons being released if they have enough energy. So that is limiting the current. Okay, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to connect the battery the other way around, making this plate negative. Now the electrons are getting repelled. And the slow electrons, the ones that leave with a low amount of kinetic energy, are going to get stopped and they're not going to reach the other end. So the current has decreased. And if you carry on going, if you carry on making this plate more and more negative, eventually you're going to get to a point where even the electrons with the highest kinetic energy are going to be stopped. And at this potential, this is called the uh, stopping potential, where the current becomes zero because all the electrons are being stopped, including those that are coming out with the highest velocity and uh, the maximum kinetic energy. Okay, so the stopping potential can be used to calculate the maximum kinetic energy. So we know potential difference is work done per unit charge. Just rearrange this equation, we get this. And instead of the V there, we're going to use a stop potential there. And instead of energy, we're going to use a, uh, we're going to have the maximum kinetic energy there. And the charge here is going to be the charge of an electron. So in this case, the stop potential over here is 0 0.4 volts. So if you multiply that by the charge of an electron, we can get the maximum kinetic energy, which is 6.4 times the power of minus 20 joules. Okay, so this whole process can be represented on a graph. On the y-axis, we've got the photo current, basically the amount of charge that's flowing around the circuit. On the x-axis, we've got the potential difference. We're going to start with the positive potential difference. So when we apply positive potential difference, we notice that the current is fairly constant, doesn't really change much. Um, that's because the number of electrons being emitted per unit time is being limited by the brightness of the light, basically the number of photons being emitted per unit time. But when we apply a negative potential difference, the, the current starts to decrease. That's because the electrons that are being emitted with a low amount of kinetic energy are being attracted back to the positive plate, so they're not reaching the negative plate, so the current starts to decrease. And then eventually, if you keep making the uh, potential difference more and more negative, you get to the stopping potential here. And we can just read off this graph and find the stopping potential. Okay, so if I use a higher frequency light, for example, violet, and the electrons are of course going to come out faster, so the stopping potential will be larger. And then I can just multiply that by the charge of an electron to find this stopping potential. Okay, so after varying the frequency of the light and measuring the corresponding maximum kinetic energy, I want to use this data to find Planck's constant and the work function of the metal. I can use this equation here, and because I have two unknowns, I'll have to use two sets of data and I could solve simultaneously. A better way of doing this would be to draw a graph. And the most important graph, that is the most useful graph, would be a straight line. So I'm going to write the equation of a line here. And just by comparing these equations here and looking at what set of data I have, it'd be use, it would make sense to plot the maximum kinetic energy on the y-axis. And on the x-axis, I can plot the frequency that I used. Okay, so the thing that's multiplying the x-axis, or in this case, the frequency, is going to be the gradient here. So in this case, it's going to be Planck's constant is going to equal the gradient. And the thing that's being added to it, the plus C part, is going to be minus of the work function here. So this would give us a straight line like this, where the gradient is going to equal Planck's constant, and the y-intercept is going to equal negative of the work function. So we can see the y-intercept will be all the way down here. We can't measure it down there right now, so, but there is a different way of solving this. But you can see that's where you'll find the work function like that. Okay. So to do that, first you're going to start off by determining the gradient. So I'm just going to read off change in y over change in x. So in this case, um, just being very careful, take these two points here. Just change in y over change in x, and that's giving us a, a number that's very close to the Planck's constant. Of course, there's going to be some error. And then to, to determine the work function, we'll have to use, we can't use the y-intercept, we'll have to use the x-intercept here. So the x-intercept here is actually the threshold frequency, because at this frequency here, we can see the electrons are coming out with zero kinetic energy. So that must mean that corresponds to the threshold frequency. So threshold frequency times Planck's constant would give us the work function. 
So there you go. The work function in this case is 1.72 electron volts.